Hello and welcome to News Clip. In the light of the Cambridge Analytica data mining scandal, today we have with us Rishabh Bailey to discuss data protection in India. Thank you for joining us. So, uh, Rishabh, my first question is, how easy is it to manipulate people's behavior using their, met their metadata? Uh, well, firstly, metadata essentially means all the information that is around the specific content that you might have sent. So if I've sent you an email, the time I've sent the email, how it's you know, going through the various nodes of the internet and so on. Now, this information can actually reveal a fair amount about a person ranging from where the person is to various habits about the person so on. Using this data you can actually build up a profile about a person. Now whether you can actually use this information to manipulate people or not is a question, um, is, 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 is something which is not necessarily certain yet. Uh, there's been more and more research happening over the last decade in particular into areas like behavioral economics and essentially how you can use data um, to try and skew people's way of thinking or uh, change their opinions. Um, experts seem to be divided on how effective this actually is, but clearly attempts are being made and more and more processes are being refined so that as time progresses, you're gonna actually find more and more methods of tinkering with the way people see and deal with information. So, so this would also include uh, formulating algorithms to generally bring people to adopt a particular mode of behavior? That's possible. Um, just for example, um, uh, two years ago, the Nobel laureates in economics were Cass Sunstein and a colleague of his who wrote on the theory of nudging. Um, and this is essentially a way in which you can control people's behaviors using s cues, environmental cues essentially. So how you can architect um, environments to make sure people behave in particular ways. And this is, of course, much easier to architect an environment when you're online. Um, so you have websites and so on which are designed to you know, gather as much information about a person as possible for a variety of reasons. Most commonly, of course, the reason is marketing and advertising because companies want to know not only that they are targeting the right people, but how effective those advertisements are. So given, so, so corporates are essentially leading this whole sort of um, research into data mining, though of course there are social users as well, as, we, as we've now seen with the Cambridge Analytica case. Okay, so um, now in the context of India, is in, in terms of uh, the privacy of an individual, is the right to privacy judgment at present the only law that sort of guarantees a right to privacy of an individual? Uh, no, actually uh, the right to privacy judgment, the Puttaswami judgment, what that did was recognize the right to privacy as a fundamental right, um, so which, which places it you know, within Article 21 of the Constitution. We do have separate privacy-related statutes and uh, legislations or, or, or laws um, in specific sectors, whether it's banking, related to healthcare, so on and so forth, but we don't have an overarching data protection legislation as of now. Um, our government has been trying now for nearly a decade virtually to put in place data protection regulation. I mean, um, about five or six years ago, we had the AP Shah Committee, which uh, presented its report put, saying that we must adopt um, privacy data protection uh, you know, legislation as soon as possible. They laid out principles, which are largely based on the uh, European Data Protection Directive um, uh, at that time. Um, and now we have the Sri Krishna Committee, which is currently looking into the issue and is, 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 is supposed to formulate a law or rec make recommendations to the government with regards to a law. So there's also been a, a data protection bill, which has been sort of doing the rounds of, you know, in draft form for quite a few years. Um, the problem, however, is at the moment, if you're talking specifically about information technology and the internet, the IT Act contains some very sort of bare provisions that deal with uh, the issue of information security. So for example, section 43A, which was introduced in I think the 2008 amendment to the act, casts an obligation on a person or a company dealing with sensitive personal information to not be negligent in protecting that information. They're supposed to take reasonable security practices, uh, put in place reasonable security practices, failing which they can be held liable and forced to pay compensation. Um, of course, the provisions, and, and we also have a certain set of rules, reasonable security practices and procedures rules, which were notified under the IT Act, which laid down very minimal and bare guidelines on what 
um, anyone who is collecting information online must do. Um, there is, however, clearly a need to strengthen our regulatory regime in this regard. Um, we've seen the, um, you know, multiple cases of misuse and unauthorized use of information. This just being the recent example because it's related to political parties being sort of the most highlighted. Uh, but there's clearly an urgent need as we move towards a more and more digital sort of environment with the government trying to push, you know, cashless transactions, this, that, and the other, of putting in place, you know, strict privacy regulation. And so how would a state theoretically regulate, say, data mining? Because you need not actually access a user's specific data to just learn their behavior or their online behavior. In the sense, uh, say someone uh, logs into Facebook, creates a Facebook account. Mm -hmm they will give up uh, quite a large amount yeah. of personal information. Yeah. Then their online behavior on Facebook, downloading various uh, apps or taking you know, surveys here and there can also add to this information. There are multiple ways in which a government can approach this. As we've already said, there must be some overarching privacy re regulation, data protection regulation that puts in place a minimum requirement of a fairly high standard, I would argue, which ensures that people who are dealing with this kind of information have responsibility to not just protect the information they that, that they've already collected, but to ensure that the information that they are collecting is actually necessary for the work that they're doing. They're just not just collecting as much information as they can get, and then they will figure out what to do with this. So there are certain basic principles. So limiting the purpose of collection, ensuring that once you know that purpose has been fulfilled, that the data is removed. There are various steps that can be taken. Now, there are broadly two sort of paths that the government could choose in this regard. One is to sort of follow the informed consent regime, in which, you, in which case you essentially cast the onus on the individual user to be responsible for his or her information. So you ensure that there's a reg legal regime that says, I must tell you what I will do with this information and give you all the information about this, but then it's your call to decide whether you want to still continue using my product or not as a user. Um, Arguably, that situation is not ideal in certain situations because, of course, we know that in a country like India, informed consent can be a huge problem in sort of bigger and more daily contexts, you know, um, let alone on the internet where most people don't read privacy policies, don't understand how these things work and so on. And that is where the whole uh, the concept of privacy by design comes in, which is where you ensure that systems are built in such a way that they automatically protect privacy without putting the onus on the, on the person on the user concerned to make that decision at every point of time, because that's really not always possible. Um, I would argue, therefore, that a law needs to have a mix of both these sort of approaches. So in the uh, case of, say, informed consent, most of the uh, end user license agreements, or generally any agreement which requires a degree of informed consent, it's written in a very legal pers uh, manner, which, uh, I mean, most people with uh, limited legal knowledge would have yeah. difficulty in understanding so so i suppose informed consent in this con uh, you know in this context would mean that uh, the language used would also be toned down in to a manner that the people can understand absolutely no um, i i completely agree with you that most people in fact would not have read these sort of long privacy policies that google facebook and and the likes put out and which means that they really don't know what is happening with their data which is what allows for these kind of practices as indulged in by facebook and cambridge analytica um, the issue, however, is slightly complicated because firstly, not only do we as sort of users need to become more aware of these kind of practices, just as you are with any new technology coming in, you need to learn what the problems with that might be. And so there's a, there's a certain social and educational aspect to this as well. However, there is clearly an, uh, a need for the law to also recognize this problem and put in place solutions. So for instance, uh, in Europe, what the data protection authorities there recommend is putting in place layered notices. So what that essentially means is that you have some very basic information right up front, and that allows you to click through and find out more and more about specific topics without putting everything into one place so that you're sort of, you know, just, just blown by an information overload. So the idea is to try, we need to find new and new ways, newer ways in which you can present this information to the public in easier formats. They've also, for instance, been attempts to create um, standardized uh, 
and tiered sort of rating systems for websites as well. So you will have an independent company that evaluates the privacy practices of a particular website and you know you might have a little logo on just as you do for various other standards in in you know sort of more in in physical life you know you'll have an ISI kind of standard kind of thing which says that this is how far they go to protect your privacy which might then mean that you don't actually have to read through the entire document. Um, of course, as with most legal documents, at the end of the day, they are complicated. So which is why you need to find a, a way to you know, explain them to the public better. And uh, so as far as data mining goes, uh, I mean, of course, you have the whole idea of the privacy issue mm -hmm. that this information can be used in various ways. But are there positive uses? Oh, definitely. Um, for starters, we've, we've been talking more and more about artificial intelligence, and artificial intelligence is essentially built using large quantities of data that are gathered. So that's just one sort of use of, of course, that could be good or bad in itself, but that's just one use. Um, data mining is used, can be used for a variety of things, whether it's doing social science research, or whether it's finding about you know, disease control, how energy is used. I mean, there are, there are a multiplicity of uses that it can be put to, and it will be and is already being put to, um, you know, whether it's to improve how football players you know, see the game and how you view statistics in, in a sport to how um, electricity grids are commissioned and you know, made more efficient and so on and so forth. The issue is, however, designing specific systems in each context which make sure, for instance, that the information on which you're basing it can be anonymized. We know that that is really, really tough to do properly because very often there have been various studies on this information, even if supposedly anonymized, can be you know, reconnected to what it was originally supposed to be. So these are sort of problems um, that we will have to deal with. Then there are also ethical issues involved, as we've clearly seen um, in the Cambridge Analytica instance. Is it fair and is it right to you know, target, target people's sort of subconscious or unconscious behaviors? To what extent can can you push these kind of um, these kind of things? Because it's been argued by Cambridge Analytica, for instance, that advertising itself is not illegal. So in in this case, if we're sending targeted advertisements, why is that a problem? Uh, so these are broader conversations that we need to have because these are clearly things that are going to affect society and our polity, our economics, at a very very large scale. Um, so it's essential that we have sort of bigger conversations and, and ensure that also there's some sort of international consensus on how to deal with these issues because these aren't issues that are located or specific to any one country. We've seen uh, the last US election, of course, was also, um, you know, there's, there's, there's this whole cloud about how the Trump campaign used Cambridge Analytica as well. We've seen the same thing in India. I remember during our last elections, there was lots of news about how Google may or may not influence our elections as well, just in terms of how they populate search results and so on, or what you know, suggestions they suggest in the search tool. So there are clearly questions about individual autonomy, how we deal with technology as a society. And it'll be interesting to see how we as a country progress in the next few years, um, particularly given, as I said, our government's push to um, ensure more and more digital in our daily lives. So in this context, uh, would the potential harm outweigh the positive uses or how can it really be balanced? I don't think we're ever going to be in a situation where we can say data should not be used. The question is how is it used, in what context is it, is it used and for what purposes is it used. And so therefore putting in place a proper legal regime which ensures that as a user firstly you have some amount of control over what is being done with your information ensuring that you are the one in control of your information as opposed to various other people or, you know, who you might have given this information to, that's also important. So I don't think it's a question of do, you can't make a generalization about whether the you know, harms outweigh uh, the benefits or vice versa. It's a question that has to be seen in specific contexts dependent on what the, the final goal is. Um, with the increases in computing power of course, it means that you'll have the ability to sift through larger and larger amounts of data, which could, you know, lead to wonderful, um, you know, whether you're talking about social science research, you know, uh, and so on. You, you might find new things, new interesting in things about how people interact. So there's great scope, and you know, to to find new information in this information, this sort of new world of data that we're living in. It's a question of how do we ensure that 
the worst practices are removed while still allowing some form of innovation and entrepreneurship to progress, yeah. Thank you, Rishabh. Oh, it's been a pleasure. That's all the time we have today. Thank you for watching NewsClick and we hope to see you soon.